Well, it is great to be with you all this morning. What a joy to be able to open up God's Word and to uh, see what God has for us this morning. And uh, I'm going to miss being with uh, you these next couple Sundays, the next uh, two Sundays. As Lord willing, I will be in Eastern Europe, even in Romania, uh, preaching at a church planting conference. So you can pray for me because the last time I preached a sermon in Romanian was about 15 years ago. So maybe more ad- ad- accurately, you should be praying for the people listening to me, butchering the beautiful language that is Romanian. But... Um, but I, I leave you all in the excellent uh, hands, as in excellent hands as Taylor Scott and uh, Justin Kaler. Each will be taking one Sunday and continue our series through uh, the Gospel of John. Well, John chapter 11 is one of the longest stories, one of the longest narratives about one particular miracle. It's the longest chapter in the book of John that emphasizes or focuses on one specific miracle, and that is the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. And uh, this miracle is perhaps one of the most dramatic uh, of all the miracles or the signs that John records in his gospel. Now, just by way of kind of a, a summary and kind of to make sure we're all on the same page and uh, we're all kind of understanding what's happening in the book at large, uh, there's certain patterns and uh, different themes that pop up throughout the book of John. Uh, John really is uh, is split into two books, if you will. I mentioned this week one in the introduction to our series, but John is really split into into two books. Book one is called the Book of Signs, and that's chapter 1 through chapter 12. It's kind of where where we end this morning, that this concludes or or it's wrapping up book one. And then book two is the Book of Glory. This is where Jesus will spend the majority of his time talking to his disciples and telling them about what's to happen. And reflecting on what he even told Nicodemus, that uh, until the Son of Man is lifted, as Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man, so the Messiah will be lifted up, so that all who believe in him might live. And so, book 2, chapters 13, all the way through the end of John, chapter 21, will emphasize uh, this, this glory by the cross. This, this crown that has to go through the cross, that the glory that Jesus is speaking about is drawing all people to himself, and it's not the kind of glory that we would think of, but it's the glory that is lasting, that's everlasting, the one that, that has eternal significance. And John also highlights these seven signs, or, or seven miracles. And as you would expect, all seven of these miracles or signs take place in book one. So this morning, the resurrection of Lazarus, or the rising of of Lazarus, is the last of the seven signs. And so what's really interesting is that in every one of the four synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, there is some type of a resurrection story. Whether it's Jesus resurrecting the the 12-year-old girl who had died, or Jesus raising uh, the son of the widow, that they were taking him to be buried, and Jesus raises him uh, from the dead. But John is the only uh, book that records the the resurrection of Lazarus, and he spends almost 57 verses describing in detail what took place. But John also records these seven I am statements, and this morning we're looking at the fifth one. We saw in uh, John chapter 6 that Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. In chapter 8, I am the light of the world. In chapter 10, I am the door of the sheep. In chapter 10, again, I am the good shepherd. And uh, this morning, we'll look at Jesus saying his I am statement, I am the resurrection and the life. And then chapters 14 and 15, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then chapter 15, I am the true vine. But again, these first four I am statements is Jesus making himself known to the crowds. Make himself known to to those that were not part of his inner circle, if you will. These last three a.m. statements, Jesus is making himself even more fully known to those who believe in him. These last three a.m. statements, beginning with this one in John 11, are for his sheep, as he describes them in John chapter 10. So this morning we're looking at John 11. We're looking at this miracle, and uh, this is such a beautiful text. It is so rich and deep, and uh, we won't have time to really go verse by verse and and parse it. Uh, But please, the reason I read it is because it's such a beautiful story. It's a true story. It actually happened. Uh, And there's such deep, practical, and theological truths in it. So uh, please study it this week. Uh, Go 
we go back and read it. Um, this morning, really, I only have time to cover two main themes, if you will. Uh, in verses 1 through 3, uh, we'll see the theme of, of prayer, uh, that, that we have the, the privilege of prayer. And then second, the, the, the theme that comes out of this text is Jesus' purpose in everything is perfect. That Jesus has a, a perfect purpose for everything that goes on in our lives. So let's start in verses 1 through 3, that, that we have this, this privilege of prayer. John picks off where, where we left off last week, and we don't know exactly how long the time between the end of chapter 10 to the beginning of chapter 11 takes place. Maybe a couple weeks, maybe a couple months. Long enough and short enough that there's still some suspicion to whether or not they're going to be able to go to Jerusalem and not die. As we'll see, Thomas saying, Jesus, don't you remember they wanted to stone you, and now we're going to go there? Okay, this seems like a suicide mission. So it was close enough that things were still kind of, the tension was still palpable. Uh, it, it was still kind of an intense situation to be a part of. But, as we know, Jesus has relocated around the area of the Jordan, and he's ministering there. He's doing uh, ministry there. But while he's there, there's a, a medical emergency. We see this in verse 1 of chapter 11. In the house of Martha, in the house of Mary, and Lazarus. And so there's a, a picture here, the ruins of Bethany. This is kind of uh, what it, it looked like in the early 1900s. Um, so there's a medical emergency in this house. And in other translations, they use the word behold. Uh, and it, it can be translated both behold or now. It both, it, it denotes suddenness. That Lazarus wasn't just sick for a while. It, it came upon him immediately, and this was a crisis. Something happened, and immediately it was clear that he's not going to make it. And it was, verse 2, it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment, whose brother was ill. And this is interesting because John doesn't write about this until chapter 12. But in the original audience, everyone knew the story so well that John says, oh, it was the same Mary that anointed Jesus' feet with oil. And even though he doesn't write for it, uh, about it for another chapter, it was so well known what Mary had done. And there's some uh, pictures of kind of those jar containers that would hold that, um, that ointment. In verse 3, so the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now, John will say this a couple times, that Jesus, now Jesus loved Lazarus, and Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And it's, it's kind of neat because John is known as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And, and there's this like, hey, uh, so Jesus really loves me, but, but I know what it's like to be loved by Jesus. And, and it was clear that Jesus had this, this deep affection for this, for this family. This family was unique in the sense that they were well off. Uh, they, they were pretty affluent. Uh, it was, we know that because of the fact that he was buried in a tomb, the fact that the religious leaders are there to mourn his passing, and also that the Jews, the religious leaders are there, and, and they're by the, um, by the grave site and watching what Jesus is going to do. But the sisters sent to him a message, most likely by a messenger. That also costs money. Go quickly. And go tell Jesus, the one whom you love is ill. And what happens next sets the stage for the events leading up to this miracle. But before we dive into the miracle, a few practical points. Because here we can see what, it, what our heart posture should be when it, when it comes to prayer. Because I think sometimes we wrongly assume that because Jesus loves us, no harm or difficulty should ever beset us. That if Jesus loves us, then he shouldn't allow difficulties. He shouldn't allow suffering. And, and we can wrongly conclude that suffering and illness and hardships are, are all indicators of God's separation or God being removed from us. And we know that God's word speaks clearly that come what may, nothing and no one can separate us from the love of God. We know that any and all trials and hardships pass through the Maker's hands who has redeemed us and uses them for His glory and ultimately for our good. But this also does not mean that we go about our humanity like anyone else. That we as believers, we have a privilege of prayer. We have the privilege of coming before God in a certain way. And, and here's kind of, in these three short verses, 
some three important points about prayer. Number one is that we make every need known to the Lord in prayer. Lord, the one that you love is ill. It wasn't necessarily even a request. Hey, Jesus, uh, come quickly. You need to be here. It was just, Lord, just want to let you know. I'm going to put this before you. The one that you love is ill. I'm, I'm sure Mary and Martha longed to say, come quickly, hurry up. Or, Jesus, didn't you do some miracle where you didn't even have to go to the place? You just told that, that son, I'm sorry, that father of that son, that he'll be healed. Can you just, from afar, can you just do that? Lord, the one that you love is ill. And yet, we can only imagine that while they put this out before the Lord, now as we make our needs known to the Lord, there's a sense of, Lord, are you, are you hearing me? Are, are, are you listening? And yes, while we make every need known to the Lord, there, there are also certain responsibilities that we take as believers. We should, yes, make every use of good and natural means, such as medicine, or uh, if you're looking for, a, if you don't have a job, to look and apply for a job. You don't just sit and say, Lord, I need a job, but I'm not doing anything. There's practical steps we take, and yet there's this reality of us having the privilege of making all of our needs known to the Lord. Second, we, we appeal to Jesus on his basis of his love for us. Lord, he whom you love. We appeal to Jesus not on our, not our basis of our love for him, but his love for us. And there's, there's power in that. It's not that Lazarus did not love Jesus. It's not that they, Mary and Martha, didn't love Jesus, but it's that they're asking him knowing that Jesus loves us. And we appeal to him based on his love for us. And this principle is true for, for really every area of our lives. Knowing this gives us confidence and boldness in our prayers. And, and when we do feel distant, it's not because of our perceived uh, nearness to God that makes our prayers effective. It's not when we feel like we're far away from God, that, 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 that doesn't mean that God doesn't hear our prayers. Our prayers are not offered up in our name, but in his name. Our prayers are not heard because of our love for Jesus, but because of our shepherd's love for us, his sheep. And third, we leave the response, oof, this is hard, and timing to God. We make our petitions known to him. We, we make those petitions. We, we pray on the basis of his love for us, not that we've deserved some merit before God, not that God, that we have some, some bank account that God owes us anything, but lastly, we leave the response and timing to God. Because the, the, the purpose of prayer is not to induce or to demand a response from God. The purpose of prayer is to uh, realign our will with God's and then to resubmit our lives to Him. That's the purpose of prayer. A prayer is self-denial. Prayer many times seems impossible. Paul will write that the Holy Spirit Himself groans and he, he knows our groanings. He understands that sometimes we don't, have the, we don't have the words to be able to pray. And yet God knows and he intercedes for us. Prayer is meant to free us from our illusion of control where we place ourselves over and over and over again into the hand of the one who holds us. This week I heard a quote from someone in our church who's going through a very difficult hardship this is what this individual said, that even though I do not like the road, I'm at peace knowing who is behind the wheel. That hits different when you're going through that difficulty. And the better we know our shepherd, the better we know his holiness, his power, his wisdom, and his love, the, the more our prayers will be a response to his character. And Paul would remind us in, jo in uh, Romans chapter 8 that God who's already sent us his best in sending Jesus, will he not also with him graciously give us all things according to his good plan and according to his good timing? So three practical takeaways for prayer as we see in verses 1 through 3. But second, second theme, Jesus' purpose in everything is perfect. The purpose of Jesus in everything is time to perfection. And, and the, the purpose of God in everything is that it would lead to his glory and our ultimate good in that order. Sometimes we want to reverse it. God, if, if you'll make this good for me, then you'll get the glory. Then it's 
I'll praise your name. But the reality is that God does everything in our lives primarily so that his glory might be seen and it will ultimately lead to our good. And that's difficult for us to understand when we don't see the whole picture. Everything, in everything, the glory of God is being revealed while it leads to our ultimate good. Now, I think there's also an important distinction in verses 4 through 57 that we must make here that God is not twisted. God is not manipulative in orchestrating pain so that he can get the glory. No, rather, as one commentator writes, the death of Lazarus will prove to be for God's glory, not in order that God may be glorified, but that in order that God's glory might be revealed in this, in spite of this situation, that even in death, God is able and will reveal himself. Even in the confusion of pain, God is able and will make himself Known. And then you've got this confusing set of verses. Verse 5 and 6. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two more days. Jesus loved them, knew that they wanted him there, and because he loved them, he said, I'm going to go ahead and wait a while. So what, what does this mean? What is it, what's this all about? See, Jesus' delay was motivated by his love and by his perfect care for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And again, we we hear that, we're like, how? How can that be? And I think if we're honest, there are times where we find it difficult to understand, to understand the goodness of God in light of our own suffering. But no matter how difficult it is for us to understand or how it might appear, God's delays are always delays of love. That God loves you, God loves me, and his delays are delays of love. Jesus already knew what he was going to do. And he knew that his waiting was going to lead to the ultimate good for Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Leon Morris writes this, that the same might be said of our own trials. We might be subject to injustice now, but in the end, believers will be justified by God. We might suffer humiliation, but it leads to glorification. We might struggle in poverty, but it's out of this secure, uh, out of this comes heavenly riches. We might be lonely or sorrowful, but trusting in Jesus, who secured every spiritual blessing for us through his death and resurrection, we will have fellowship with God and other believers. The Jesus' words might be engraved on every Christian tombstone, This does not lead to death, but to God's glory. So Jesus works in our lives according to his timetable and his purposes, and he loves us perfectly. And I think it's interesting that this is the third time in John that we have seen Jesus delayed, not because he didn't want to do something, but because it was not the right time. The first time we saw at the the first miracle, the, the wedding in Cana, His mother says, they ran out of wine. Jesus, do something. And Jesus says, my time's not yet come. And then a couple minutes later, maybe hours later, Jesus turns the water into wine. And the second time was at the Feast of Tabernacle. His brothers say, hey, everyone needs to know what you're doing. So go to Jerusalem and put on a big show. Go get some followers. I'm sorry, go get some fans. And Jesus says, no, my time has not yet come. And there's a third time now. Mary and Martha say, Jesus, The one you love is ill. And Jesus says, okay, but I'm going to wait two more days. And then he says to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. And again, I I love the response that you have from the disciples. Uh, Jesus, again, do you remember what happened in chapter 10? Uh, There were stones in the religious leaders' hands as they were about to kill you, and somehow you disappeared. And um, our names are actually written on those stones, okay? So it's not just you they want to kill, but us too. So then that's why Thomas, called Doubting Thomas, or maybe in this occasion, Realistic Thomas, right? Uh, Jesus, we're going to die too. So you know what, guys? If we're going to die, let's at least, let's go, let's go back to Jerusalem and let's, let's die with Jesus. I don't think this was cynical. I don't think it's an exaggeration. I think they really thought that when they go back to Judea, this is it. This is it. But Jesus tells his disciples in verse um, in verse nine and ten that there is still time in the day, meaning that 
His time is not up. There's still work to be done. The sun is still here. Pun intended, the Son of God is still around, and according to the, the calendar, the clock, the Jewish clock, 12 hours in a day, the Son is still here, I still have work to do, but when the right time comes, that is when I will die. When the time comes, when it's fulfilled, then it will happen. Not a minute before, not a minute after. So let's go to Judea and wake up Lazarus, because he is sleeping. Now, Jesus calls the death of Lazarus sleep, and he does the same thing in Matthew chapter 9. That's a, a, a Jewish um, kind of sundial of sorts, kind of telling the time of the day. But Jesus calls the death of Lazarus, Lazarus sleep, but th this speaks to the, the truth that for believers, death does not mean separation. Death is that doorway, the same way that when we go to sleep and we wake up, we enter into a new realm of consciousness, if you will. It, it's, it's, as one commentator writes, it, that there's no substantial evil in death. The shadow of a serpent will not sting, nor the shadow of a sword kill. And to be sure, it is dreadful to stand in the shadow of so fearsome an enemy as death. But Christians know that Christ has removed its sting. That Jesus went, underwent the full horror that is death, and in doing so has transformed death so that for his followers, it's no more than just sleep. And then chapter, uh, then verses 17 all the way to verse 46, the I am statements. Again, Jesus says, let's go. It's been four days since Lazarus has died. That's significant in that there was no doubt that Lazarus was dead. Like he was clearly dead. And Jesus walks into, into the city and he sees all these religious leaders are there to console the sisters. Clearly they had influence. Clearly they were of some noble status. And Martha's first words are, Jesus, if you'd been here, this would not have happened. And Jesus does not chide her. He doesn't tell her to, to stop feeling this way. But instead he says, your brother will raise again, will rise again. And I think this is an important thing for us to understand, church, that, that Jesus invites us to pour our hearts to him. He does not say, why are you feeling this way? He invites us to, to bring our emotions to him. He says, your, your brother will raise again, will rise again. And Martha had probably heard those words a dozen times over the course of the past four days. But Jesus says, no, no, you're, let me explain to you what I'm saying, Martha. No, no, he won't just rise again eventually one day. No, no, I am the resurrection. I am the life. And whoever believes in me, though he or she die, Yet shall they live. And I think a practical point here for us that what can happen to us as believers when we grieve is that we can lose hold of the truth that we know so well about the Lord when we're not grieving. And this is why, excuse me, it's so important to be told and retold what is true. As one pastor writes that when eyes are clouded by tears who fail to see and when trembling hands lose their grip on faith, our calling is not to rebuke them for unbelief, but to gently remind them of the grace and truth of the Lord. This is meant to be the highest form of Christian comfort, is to direct the suffering hearts to Jesus. And when Jesus tells Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, he does not say that I've come to bring resurrection. No, he says, I am the resurrection. I, I haven't just come to, to give you hope for the future. No, I'm, I'm hope for now as well. Martha believes this in verse 31 and declares her belief. And as one commentator puts it, that Jesus diverts Martha's focus and attention from this abstract belief and what will happen one day to personalizing it for this moment. That the same way Jesus says that, that I am the bread of life, that, 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 that that's not just for the future, that's for now. Not only is he going to raise the dead, physically one day, but he's actually come to do that spiritually even now, today. And then in verse 33 through 35, Jesus sees Mary and Martha weeping, and it says here that he's moved in his spirit, and he's, and he's, greatly, he's greatly troubled. The, the word there, to be deeply moved, comes from this ancient Greek word that describes a horse kind of snorting angrily. 
He's troubled. Why? He knows what he's about to do. Why is Jesus troubled? Why is he angry? Why, why is he filled with emotion? Because seeing all this heartache, all this sorrow, all this hopelessness produces in him this emotional response because Jesus is the God who suffers with his people. Jesus is the one who, who understands our heartache while still being the very balm for our heartache. Jesus is the one who, who as the preacher says in Hebrews, he's that high priest who's able to sympathize in all of our emotions, in all of our weaknesses, and yet is without sin. The fact that this verse, the shortest verse, Jesus wept, it's so profound because it means that Jesus knows what you are feeling. Jesus feels what you have felt and what you're feeling. He understands. And the best news is that not only does Jesus know and feel and understand, he's able. It's one thing to sympathize. It's an, uh, another thing entirely altogether to be able to sympathize and also to be the, the answer to all these things that are broken. So Jesus is looking at the situation. He's angry. Not because he's frustrated that he can't do anything about it, but because look what sin has done to his creation. Look what death has brought to the life that he has come to bring. He's moved by, their, by grief because he's angry at sin and sickness and death in this fallen world that's wreaked so much havoc. And, and Jesus wept. It's, it's differently than the weeping of Mary and of Martha. It, it's, it's, it's this anger of saying, no. It, it's, it's when something bad happens to your child and, you're, and you can fix it, but you're angry that they got hurt. And Jesus says, no, this is mine. Satan, you have no, no right. And I'm, I've come here to actually bring hope. And he looks at this crowd and they're mourning, weeping as if there is no hope. And then one commentator says that the, the same sin and death, the same unbelief that prompted his outrage also generated his grief. And that those of us who follow Jesus as his disciples today would do well to learn the same tension, that grief and compassion without outrage to sin will just produce mere sentiment. While I, outrage without grief, without our hearts breaking for the sin and the sinner, will produce this self-righteous arrogance. But here comes Jesus to the tomb. It was a cave, and there's a stone laid against it. Again, illustrating that Lazarus was a man of means because he could afford to have a tomb. And he tells the men, remove it. And then Jesus prays and says, Father, I'm praying, and I thank you that you listen to me, and I know you always listen to me, but I'm praying so that all these people who wanted to stone me a couple months ago might be able to see that you not only hear me, and, but that I'm able to do what you have called me and told me to do. So then Jesus cries out, Lazarus, come out. And, and, and the power was not in him yelling as if Lazarus needed to hear Jesus shouting. He could have whispered. He could have just thought, and Lazarus would have come out doing the, you know, the tombstone shuffle. But the point is, it didn't matter how loud Jesus yelled. It was Lazarus by name, and some commentators joke and say it's a good thing he called them by name because had he just said, come out, everyone would have resurrected from the dead. What a sight that would have been, right? But, but here's the point, that Jesus calls Lazarus, and, and by the word of Christ, a dead man rose. And this is the exact same thing as we close this one. It's the exact same resurrection picture of every conversion that takes place. It's by the call of Jesus saying, you who are dead in your sins, come out. You are wrapped in the cloths of sin and wickedness, come forth. And, and the call of Christ has the power to raise the dead and to convert the sinner. And, and the question for those of you sitting here this morning is, are you still dead in your sins? Are you still wrapped in all those cloths of sin? Jesus has come. He is the resurrection and the life. He calls you out of death into life. And there's a picture of, of the tomb there. That's actually, today you can go to Israel. It's the tomb they, they are pretty sure it was Lazarus' tomb. And, and Jesus calls you out of that darkness into that light. But here's an encouragement for those of us who are believers. Because the, the account of Lazarus Resurrecting includes this amazing detail that as 
Lazarus comes out. Jesus tells the other people, hey, start to un un unbound him. Take all those cloths off of him. Unbind him and let him go. Earlier, Jesus had called others to remove the stone. Now he's calling others to remove Lazarus' grave clothes. And, and, and this, is, this is a picture of what God calls us to do in people's lives as well, that we have the privilege of playing a part in people's salvation, in their redemption. And this means that the power of Christ, even through poor preaching and stammering witnesses, has the power to save those who hear. This is an amazing story I read this week about this. This pastor went to, to Uganda and was preaching to a group of, of Muslim men and women. They were just asking him all these questions and bombarding him with all these questions. And he was trying to answer them as faithfully to Scripture as possible. And then he kept presenting the gospel over and over again and he just felt like he needed to keep explaining it over and over and over again so then he stops after a while and just says do you guys want to respond and and one one of the men says this he says uh munguzu that is white man we have already believed we were just waiting for you to stop talking so we can tell you <laughs> that that beautiful that beautiful moment it doesn't matter how feeble you feel you are it doesn't matter how, how you feel like I just don't have the right words it's, it's not your words that have power it's Christ that does the work and, and James Montgomery Boyce he says this he says we cannot bring the dead back to life but we can bring the word of Christ to them we can do the, the preparatory work we can, we can do the work afterwards we can help remove the stones the stones of ignorance of error of prejudice of despair and after the miracle we can help this new Christian by unwinding the grave cloths of doubt of fear of introspection and discouragement A.W. Pink what a name right A.W. Pink he writes this he says that there is no higher privilege this side of heaven than for us to be used of the Lord in rolling away gravestones and removing grave clothes. I pray that we would be willing and ready to play such a role in the saving work that Jesus does in people's lives. Will you join me in prayer? God, thank you again for your word, living and active. Thank you that you have called those who are dead to life. Thank you, Lord, that you do that in our lives spiritually as a testimony and as a precursor of what will happen in that day yet to come where every person who has ever lived will be resurrected to stand before you to give an account of what they've done with the free gift of Christ. And on that day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of you. I pray that this morning there would be those who, if they've never bent the knee of their heart, that they would do that this morning. That you would call them out of death into life, out of darkness into light. I pray that you would continue to use us to do that. I pray that we would never rely on programs or on our ability to enunciate or to explain, but that we would prayerfully and daily rely upon your grace and your strength, that we would be instruments in the hand of the Redeemer, that you'd use us, and that we would be ready and willing to be used for your glory and for the good of those who have yet to hear and yet to believe. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen.